Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Eagle Forum. There's a debate in the academic community over whether he really said this or not, but Alexis de Tocqueville is credited with saying, as you all have heard many times, America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Eagle Forum has stood in the gap and fought for goodness in Alabama for decades. Eagle Forum of Alabama in particular has stood strong year after year after year. And the heart and soul of the, I would be remiss if I said that Uni Smith was the heart and soul of that effort for two reasons. Because first off, she's not just the heart and soul. She's the intellect, she's the strategic thinking, and she's the diplomacy that makes this Alabama Eagle Forum operate the way it's supposed to. But then secondly, she would really be upset with me if I left it that she was the heart and soul. Because I know her belief is that you in this audience, and that may be watching this video, in this meeting and meetings last year and the year before and in meetings all over, over the state, you're the heart and soul. You're the ones who love the Lord. You're the ones who care about the future and the communities that we live in and the future of Alabama and the principles of goodness that you fight for. And um, I, I, I know that she would say, no, you're the heart and soul of Eagle Forum. If it was not for you and Uni, and now she's partnering with Becky Gerritsen to help run Eagle Forum Alabama. We would have had gambling in Alabama 20 years ago, full-fledged gambling. The sad truth is the gambling forces only have to win once, and they will have gambling in Alabama. The, those like you who have opposed gambling and uni have had to win every year for almost 20 years. They can win once, you have to win every time. And this time, the opposition, I think, is better organized, better planned, better financed, more sophisticated, and tougher than it's ever been. Which is why the bills that we're talking about tonight have already passed the House of Representative with a, Representatives with a comfortable margin. They had to have, what, 63 votes, Uni? They had 70 votes in the House of Representatives. Now, the good news is, the good news is that the Senate is tighter. And um, we think that, uh, and, 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 and Uni tells me that she thinks that there may be four or five senators that could go one way or the other. We, it could be lost in the Senate by two votes. It could be won in the Senate by two or three votes. And so that's why it's important that you're here tonight and that you're concerned about uh, this issue. So what I'd like to do tonight is uh, talk with you about what these bills do first. And then secondly, talk with you about gambling generally. To talk to you about what these bills do, there are two bills, um, and they're now in the Senate, as I said. We start with the fact that gambling is illegal in Alabama because the Constitution of Alabama since 1901 has said that gambling is illegal. Section 65 of the Alabama Constitution makes lotteries and all games of chance uh, in the nature of lotteries illegal. Now, at first you think, well, wait, lottery, that, that's just the scratch-off tickets or the lotto number picks. But the courts for ever have interpreted that provision as meaning games of chance are illegal in Alabama. Now, there are two, ex two types of exceptions. Number one, Local constitutional amendments have permitted dog and horse track betting in Jefferson and Mobile County at specific locations. And also, local constitutional, remember, the, the basic prohibition, prohibition is a constitutional prohibition. So you had to have a local constitutional amendment to allow the Birmingham racetrack to ever be formed. You had to have a local constitutional amendment for Mobile to allow the track down there to ever exist for dog racing. Likewise, a second form that exists in Alabama, in 16 localities, over the last 40 years, the legislature has passed constitutional amendments to allow bingo in certain counties and cities, 16 of them roughly. Many of you will know and recall that during the 2010s, there was this huge debate over whether that meant electronic bingo or only regular, good old-fashioned church basement bingo with paper cards. 
This is a um, <coughs> this is the cases that were decided by the Alabama Supreme Court between 2009 and 2017. Normally, to declare that those references to bingo in the local constitutional amendments mean only paper, old-fashioned card bingo, where somebody stands at the front of the room, calls out a number, you've got to pay attention, you've got to mark your card, you might miss it, you might not, you've got to be the first to stand up. It would just take one opinion. And in fact, that's really all it did take, was one opinion. But nine more, eight more were issued over that nine-year period, about one a year. Is it nine years, eight years, whatever the math is, from 2009 to 2017? Time and time again. In fact, in the last of these opinions, the Alabama Supreme Court said that we have ruled that the reference to bingo in these local constitutional amendments means paper bingo, and we have ruled that, quote, over and over and over again, unquote. Again, you should only have to have one precedent to establish what the law is on any given topic in a given state. And the court was frustrated, and then it added, it's now time for law enforcement to enforce the law. So it's illegal, except for old-fashioned paper bingo in about 16 counties and the dog and the horse track betting. So the first thing that is pending in the legislature that has to uh, be passed is a constitutional amendment to repeal Section 65's prohibition on gambling in general. And that is this, where is it? That is this eight-page document. It repeals Section 65 and replaces it with an expanded Section 65. And then this 140-page document um, sets out all the details and puts the meat on the bones of how all this is going to work, supposedly, or at least in the beginning. Now, in general, what you get with these two documents, these two bills, is three forms, new forms of gambling. Casinos, sports betting online, and the lottery. Now, the casinos, there's a provision in the Constitutional Amendment for 10 casinos. Birmingham, no, uh, now the Constitutional Amendment, we'll come back to this in a minute, the Constitutional Amendment does not specify any of these locations that I'm about to give you. That's all in the enabling legislation, okay? But when you read the enabling legislation, the 10 casino locations would be Birmingham, wherever the city council and the new gaming commission decide to locate it. Most people think it would be at the racetrack. It could be in the entertainment district or downtown Birmingham. It could be anything that's inside the city limits of Birmingham. If they want to tear down the zoo and put it there, they could do that. Mobile County, Greene County, Macon County, Houston County, and Lowndes County. That's six locations. Then you take the three from the Porch Creek Indians that they have now, you count those, that's Wetumpka, Montgomery, and Atmore. And then the Constitutional Amendment says there'll be one more location. So that's a total of 10. The enabling legislation says that the 10th location will be pursuant to a compact entered into with the Porch Creek Indians for a location in far northeast Alabama near, uh, near the Georgia line because there are no casinos in Georgia. Uh, that, that location would be, if you read the enabling legislation, it would either be DeKalb or, or Jackson County, Scottsboro, Fort Payne. I guess it could be at Mentone and right next to Alpine Camp for any of you guys that sent your boys to Alpine. So that's casinos, 10 casinos spread all over the state. Again, the locations are not set in the constitutional amendment. They're set in the bill. And so we'll come back to that point. Um, the, 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 I will add this. The, I'm told that the Porch Creek desperately want a casino in Orange County, in, in Baldwin County, in Orange Beach, as close to the beach as they can get it, obviously. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Second thing, sports betting. Online sports betting, FanDuel, DraftKings, some of those advertisements you saw during the Super Bowl recently. Think cell phone. Think young male adults trying to start their careers, getting reminders on their cell phones in their offices, offering them credits to come back and bet again. It's been said 
oh, think fraternity guys coming home from a party at 3 a.m. in the morning and plopping down in their bed and opening their cell phones and the condition they're in and they can gamble right then and there. It's been said that online gambling will bring gambling into our living rooms here in Alabama. No. Yes, but also it's going to bring it into the bed, into the kitchen, into your office, into the back, wherever, wherever you have your cell phone. Online gambling will be with Alabamians under this bill, in addition to being allowed, the sports betting being allowed at the casino locations. Uh, and then finally, the statewide lottery. Now, the lottery starts out in the enabling legislation as old-fashioned regular lottery. Uh, I mean, old-fashioned. I'm thinking about bingo. It starts out as a regular lottery with the paper tickets, the scratch-off tickets, picking a number, the, the jackpot where you win with the, uh, by having the right set of numbers. Um, but we'll come back to that point uh, in a minute as well. Section 60, the new Section 65C of the Alabama Constitution allows legislators to add types of gambling as long as the new gaming commission recommends them and they can get three -fifths, a three-fifths vote. You, we, you will not, they will not have to come back to the people for a new constitutional amendment. So you've got a constitutional amendment that says it's going to be casinos and sports betting and, and a lottery. But once that's enacted, then the legislature, if they can get three-fifths of, of each house to agree, they can change that traditional lottery into an electronic lottery, again, on your cell phones. Uh, they can change the sports betting on your cell phone to casino games and roulette and all manner of things that could be coming into your phone electronically uh, if, they, if they have the votes. Section 65C also allows the legislature uh, to change the taxation rate without going back to the people for a vote on a new constitutional amendment. Uh, the current illegal gambling that's going on in the state of Alabama, the electronic bingo machines, are under this legislation, under this constitutional amendment, are grandfathered in and allowed to now operate legally for the next three years, supposedly that being the transition time until the lotteries and the new casinos can be built. At that point, they have to, to leave operation theoretically. But they have persevered in operating illegally, fighting the Attorney General year after year for all these years, and now they're being rewarded for their perseverance with a grandfathered in, sanctioned three-year grace period to continue operating. As I said, the locations uh, are uh, not set by the constitutional amendment. Now, I mentioned a couple of provisions like the tax rate, uh, the different types of gambling that would require a three-fifths vote in future legislative sessions, but not a constitutional amendment. Well, get this. The locations don't even require a three-fifths vote. If next year the legislature says, you know, nobody's applied for that license that we can issue for Lowndes County, I guess it's because it's right next to Montgomery and Wetumpka and not far from Atmore. You know, let's just change that license and make it Orange County. They can do that with, I mean, Baldwin County. They can do that with a majority vote. You know, let's put it in Huntsville, majority vote. Let's, let's put two in Birmingham, majority vote. The Alabama Supreme Court has not been friendly to gambling over the last 20 years. This bill puts all cases, all lawsuits, against the Gaming Commission in the Court of Civil Appeals. Now, I don't know what they think the Court of Civil Appeals will do differently, but apparently they're tired of seeing the Supreme Court rule against them, and they have said that all trials, now get this, this is the Court of Civil Appeals. There are not supposed to be any trials there. Those are supposed to take place in your local circuit courts, right? But they're saying that all trials of any lawsuits against the Gaming Commission must be conducted by the Court of Civil Appeals in Montgomery, and all appeals will be handled by the Court of Civil Appeals. Normal circuit court processing and Supreme Court processing are eliminated. It's a bizarre provision, uh, but apparently they think they know something about the Court of Civil Appeals that I don't know, but that at the minimum, they want to get away from the Alabama Supreme Court, apparently. 
The Gaming Commission that's created, that oversees all of this, implements the rec well, creates regulations, implements regulations. They are not answerable to any elected official. They are not elect, uh, answerable to the governor, to the legislature, obviously to most courts. Uh, if, if you, it, well, it's actually worse than that. On any licensing decision, I mentioned that if they're sued, it has to be in the Court of Civil Appeals. But the Constitutional Amendment goes one step further and says no court, not even the Court of Civil Appeals, has jurisdiction over a lawsuit against the Gaming Commission challenging their issuance of a license. So if the Gaming Commission issues, abuses its discretion and makes an arbitrary decision, if there's corruption involved in the decision, if there's bribery involved, you can't go, and you're the, you, you are the licensee, potential licensee that lost out, you can't go into court and seek redress. No court in Alabama will have jurisdiction over the Alabama Gaming Commission's decision on licenses. They become a sovereign authority unto themselves. They're even given a police force in order to make arrests. And uh, nothing in any of these bills, either of these bills, prevents, that I've seen, prevents family members of gaming commissioners from owning stock or other interests in casinos or other gambling operations. Why? Why? Oh, one last point. Alpha, God bless them, is opposed to this bill. Uh, Jimmy Parnell, the head of Alpha, stood up the other day and he said, you know, we're opposed to gambling. The farmers in Alabama are opposed to this bill. But even if we were not opposed to gambling, we'd still be opposed to this bill. And after what we've gone through, you can see some of why he is uh, opposed to it and why they are opposed to this particular bill. What, what are we being told as to the reason that we've got to do this at this point in our history? It's here. So we might as well legalize it so we can regulate it and limit it. It's not legal under state law to begin. We, we've already discussed that. It's not legal under state law. All these decisions have said that. But let me pull off, off of this stack one of these decisions because one of the arguments they make is, well, it may not be legal under state law, but state law doesn't control the Indian casinos. Federal law controls the Indian casinos. And so it's in the Indian casinos, and we can't do anything about this. We might as well legalize it for the non-Indian operators and tax it and so forth. Here's what the federal law says about Class II gaming. We only have Class II gaming in our Indian reservations right now. I could go through all the variations, but just if you'll follow me for just a minute. Indian, the PCI is now operating three casinos under a Class II gaming category. Under 25 U.S. Code, Section 2703, Subsection 7, the only form of gambling they can have that approaches anything like what they have now, which is electronic bingo. Bob, let me just stop a minute. When we say electronic bingo, I'm assuming everybody knows what we're talking about. So is not a panel up in the front of the room that electronically shows you the numbers and you're sitting at your table with your card or some sort of electronic marking pad and you're, you're, you're having to pay attention and mark one at a time. The electronic bingo that we're talking about is a machine that has bingo graphics on it or maybe it says bingo on the side and you put your money in or your credit card in and you press the right buttons and the wheels turn and the lights flash and in a moment or two, maybe three seconds, maybe four seconds, you find out whether you've won a game of bingo or not. It's a slot machine. So that's what, everything I've said about electronic bingo, that's what I've been talking about. There's electronic bingo now in the Indian Reservation casinos. And so the thinking is by some, well, you know, it's there. They've got basically electronic gambling. It's a form of slot machine. They won't admit that, but it's a form of Vegas-style gambling. So let's just let the non-Indians have some gambling while we're at it as well. But I just want you to understand that what is happening with electronic gambling in Indian reservations by the statute doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem legal. Listen to this. Under Class 2 gaming, 
you can have the game of chance commonly known as bingo. These nine opinions define what the game of chance commonly known as bingo is. And it's the old-fashioned paper card bingo where somebody calls out one number at a time and you have to pay attention, you might miss it, you have to be the first to stand up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if that were not enough, the, here's what the federal statute goes on to say as a catch-all. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which is this 25 U.S.C. Section 2703, specifically prohibits, quote, electronic or electromechanical facsimiles of any game of chance or slot machines of any kind. So this is what's prohibited in class two that they're operating under now. Electronic or electromechanical facsimiles of any game of chance or slot machines of any kind. They say bingo is permitted in 16 localities in Alabama, so therefore they should have electronic bingo, which are the slot machines or electro uh, mechanical or electronic facsimiles of slot machines. And the statute specifically says in Class 2 Gaming, no, that's not what we mean by bingo. So, number one, it's not what's going on in Alabama outside of any paper card bingo games that might be held somewhere that I don't know about. And the dog and the horse racing is illegal. It's not legal in Alabama. So, but the argument is, well, okay, it may not be legal, but you know, nobody's enforcing this stuff on the Indian reservations. They've got it. We ought to have it. You know, uh, and besides that, it's, it's happening in Alabama outside the reservations. And um, it's left and right. We can't control it. It's out of control. We need to legalize it so we can limit it. Bob Riley didn't think we needed to legalize it in order to limit it. He put on the road caravans of semi trucks, uh, tractor trailer trucks, and he put uh, caravans of state trooper cars, and they raided the casinos under our civil forfeiture laws. And they destroyed the machines that were in the Macon County casinos and Greene County and Lowndes County. And he kept doing it over and over again under the civil forfeiture law because the criminal law at the time and still today only made it a misdemeanor. So instead of prosecuting it uh, for, under a misdemeanor, he used the civil forfeiture and he did it time and again. And you know, those who supplied the machines, who leased them to the local operations, the McGregor operation in, in Macon County and so forth, they were beginning to get tired of losing their machines. And I think it was about to grind to a halt when he left office and uh, Robert Bentley became governor and he cut off all the resources of the money for the tractor trailer trucks and the state troopers and said, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, if you want to limit something, I'm not sure why you legalize it. it. This whole debate reminds me a little bit of the southern border where Biden says, give me a bill, help me get some more legislation so I can regulate this and control it and limit it. And Trump says, wait, I just used the law. I enforced the existing law and shut it down. You can either use the existing law in Alabama, the civil forfeiture law, or if you really were serious about limiting it, you would simply change it from a misdemeanor to a felony and give Attorney General Steve Marshall the, the, the tools he really needs to, to shut this down. Um, I'm just not sure how legalizing something gets you less of it, Jocelyn. It's like marijuana. Yeah. Tax. Tax money. Well, we need the tax. You know, in the last 10 years, our state budgets have increased 81%. They've almost doubled in just 10 years. Think about it. Mazda Toyota has come to Alabama. FBI offices have moved on to Redstone Arsenal. Redstone Arsenal itself has expanded. Airbus, Austell, uh, and Mobile. Good paying, high paying, quality industry has been coming to Alabama. And that's why our revenues have increased almost twofold uh, here in Alabama for the last 10 years. So what does that mean for our budgets? 2022 was a record education budget. In 2023, there was a record education budget that was several hundred million dollars more than 2022. In 2024, the fiscal year we're in now, the projection is, you know, you budget based on projections. And then at the end of the year, you, 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 you even up to see if you fell short or you have some surplus. 
the projection for 2024 is a record 500 for the education budget alone, $537 million more than the record budget in 2023. General fund budget, record in 2022, record in 2023. This year in 2024, we have budgeted a, uh, another record, some 200 and something million, did I say thousand a moment ago? Good, 200 and something, 537 million more on the education, 250-ish million dollars more on the general fund budget this year than we had in last year's record general fund budget. None of that counts the fact that we had a $3.2 billion surplus at the end of 2023, mostly because of COVID money from the federal government. The Legislative Services Agency projects that both budgets combined at the end of 2024 will uh, have a balance of $2 billion, and at the end of 2000, uh, 2024 we'll have a balance of $2 billion, and at the end of 2025 we'll have a balance of $1.6 billion. If ever there was a time when we did not need additional revenue from gambling, this is it. Now they talk about $900 million coming from these gambling bills. I believe that that number is pathologically inflated. I think if you look at the, the projections for gambling revenues in state after state after state over the last 40 years, the, re the projections never come out the way they're projected. And if they come close, then it tapers off in the following years when the luster has, has gone. Uh, but whatever is raised in tax revenue from gambling, think about it. That's not money coming out of somebody's 401k account, except for some addicts, unfortunately. By and large, that's not coming from somebody's IRA or investment fund. That's disposable income of Alabamians that would otherwise be spent on gas and eggs and, and diapers and, and um, backyard grills and other things that generate sales taxes. It's not being spent on that now. So you're losing your sales tax. That money that otherwise would be spent on other things helps the economy generally. It generates more economic flow, so it increases the income taxes. So you've got to net out your losses from those other taxes because of the money now going to the gambling. Um, my favorite reason that they give for why we've got to act now and increase gambling is you can't legislate morality. Florence, did you take Latin in high school? <laughs> did anybody take Latin in high school? Oh, we have some takers, some winners. Great. In co or, or college. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so, help me, you, you can confirm what I'm about to tell you. We brought over from England to the American colonies two concepts that largely inform our common law, our common law uh, for cr criminal law and for civil law. And those are malum in se and malum prohibitum. Malum in se, bad in itself. Malum prohibitum, illegal because we say it's illegal. You file your tax return on April 16th instead of 15th, that's illegal. But it's not evil per se. It's just illegal because we say it's illegal. Malum in se offenses form the bulk of the criminal laws in this country, even the civil laws. So, you look at that and you think, okay, killing another person, not in self-defense, well, we think that's bad in and of itself. That's immoral. We need to legislate against that. Stealing somebody else's property, uh, that's, that, that's, that's, that's bad. We need, to, we need to make that illegal. We don't want to encourage that. We, uh, uh, harming someone physically. Uh, we, we want to discourage that. We, we, we may not be able to control it all, but we want to discourage that. Let's legislate against uh, rape and, and against uh, assault and battery. Oh, prostitution, indecent exposure. You know, we really want to minimize those in our community. Those are really bad for our children. They're bad for our culture. We, we, we can't control everybody and everything all the time, but we need to make, we need to make those illegal and try to discourage and minimize that in our society. Dr illegal drug use, that's bad for our communities. We need to minimize that and make it illegal and legislate against that immorality. 
I, I, I suppose you could say, well, if you mean by you can't legislate morality, that you can't control everybody all the time and make them do the right thing, well, I would agree with that. We all would. And so in that sense, you can't legislate morality. But that does not mean you need to legalize immorality. Um, whatever you legalize, you generally get more of. Uh, which brings us uh, to the question of the immorality of gambling itself. Should we encourage it as part of our culture? Should we discourage it? Or should we try to limit it? Just as we try to limit murder and prostitution and, and assault and battery. Commercial endeavors live and fall by the rule of win-win. I have something, you have something. If you'll give me your something, that's more valuable to me than what I'm holding. So it's a win for me to get what you've got. You find more valuable what I'm holding, and I'll give it to you, and that's a win for you. So when I go and buy that backyard grill, it's a win for the vendor, and it's a win for me. That's the basis for commercial activity. But in gambling, no new goods are produced, no new services are produced. In order for one person to win, the other person in the transaction has to lose. Think about that in terms of biblical commandments. Um, I don't think anybody in this room probably suffers from what has popularly become known as white guilt. If, raise your hand if you suffer from white guilt. We have one, maybe. Some of you may know people. I would, I would rephrase that as affluent white guilt. Okay? I don't think too many people in, that live middle income and lower income white people have white guilt. So and I'm going to rephrase it as affluent white guilt. If you are tinged with a little affluent white guilt, or you know somebody that is, before you try to talk them out of feeling that way, you first might want to find out how they feel about gambling in Alabama, whether they're encouraging their legislators to vote for it. And then if it passes, then I just leave them alone because their affluent white guilt will be fully justified. Let me ask you something. Do you guys think that more tax revenues will be generated from the playing of scratch-off tickets by Mountain Brook residents or by the residents of Fairfield and Inslee? Do you think that more tax revenues will be generated by the playing of slot machines by Mountain Brook residents or the residents of Gardendale or Jasper? The Howard Center says that stores that sell lottery tickets are disproportionately located in low-income neighborhoods. Billboards that advertise casinos and particularly the lottery are disproportionately located in poor neighborhoods. Scratch-offs are disproportionately played by low-income residents. And scratch-offs provide more state revenues in the lottery system than the normal lotto ball type drawings. Advertising impacts children. You cannot stop them from hearing the radio commercials. You can't stop them from seeing the TV advertising. So at a young age, they're exposed to all these beautiful people, these wonderful colors, this fun game. And the state, the state government is actually behind it, telling them in so many words, this is fun, this is good, you should look forward to doing this, and it begins to condition them. Of course, they can't really bet it that at, at a young age, but teenagers and young adults do constitute the largest segment of the population who call gambling helplines. I hope everybody in here will Google tonight uh, a, a, a segment from 60 Minutes that aired two weeks ago on February 4th. You could Google simply 60 Minutes Sports Gambling. 60 Minutes Sports Gambling. It is an article uh, about a middle-aged lawyer and his addiction to gambling and how the gambling apps are so effective, especially now with AI, the gambling apps are so effective at entrapping people like him uh, into gambling. 60 Minutes is no bastion of conservatism. In fact, this whole issue, just pause for a minute, this, this is not a conservative liberal issue. This is not Republican Democrat. This is 
This is a, a, a question about love versus greed, about love for your children and the community versus taking advantage of people. And, and one national organization that fights gambling says a third of all their supporters come from the Democrat ranks and those who identify as liberal because they're concerned about the effect it's having on their fellow man. But, but let me get back to what, what I was saying. Th this, this article, 60 Minutes Sports Gambling, and then uh, uh, what was said in that article is so also summarized. Who gets the Wall Street Journal? Somebody here does. Look at the February 18th, yesterday's version of the Wall, St Wall Street Journal. That was Sunday. There was none. It was published online February 18th. I bet it will be in the, tomorrow morning's paper. There is an article I said on the, on the sports betting and the online betting. Think about that young adult male. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal that you will find about a 41-year-old female psychiatrist, mother of two young boys who play soccer, talking about her online gambling addiction that she engaged in as a psychiatrist. She was addicted. She lives in a two-story house overlooking the rolling green suburb hills of Pittsburgh, much like the rolling green hills of Birmingham. It's easy to identify with her. But this article about her said, online companies closely track betting habits 24 hours a day, collecting data such as how much time each customer spends on an app, how much money they gamble, what kind of bets they place, and how much they lose. I guarantee you with AI coming into the fore, they're, they're able to understand and track what kind of reminders they've sent to you, what kind of offers they've, enticements they've sent to you, what kind of graphics have been more effective, what time of day you have responded. They know a lot more about you and your gambling proclivities than you know. And, and that's the insidious nature of, of the online gambling. Half of all gambling revenues come from those who have become addicted. Half of all gambling revenues come from those who are addicted. So for the state to be successful in sponsoring this gambling, it has got to entice people who are addicted to further their addiction. One report says 75% of all gambling is uh, of all gamblers gamble responsibly. That means 25% of all gamblers gamble irresponsibly. The 75% of gamblers who gamble responsibly generate 4% of state tax revenues. The 25% who gamble irresponsible, r irresponsibly are responsible for the other 96% of gambling revenues. Half of that coming from those who have addictions. How in the world is all of this consistent with biblical admonitions to be our brother's keeper, to love our neighbor as ourselves, or Christ's admonition that as we do unto the least of these, we do unto him. The American Psychiatric Association recognizes gambling as an, uh, a gambling addiction as a disorder. Quote, and this is from some, I think it's DSM-5. It's called the, the Bible uh, for, this, uh, 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 for the Amer uh, American Psychiatric Association. They, they say that gambling addiction is a disorder, quote, similar to substance-related disorders in clinical expression, brain origin, comorbidity, physiology and treatment. The average pathological gambler, according to one study, affects eight other people, directly or indirectly, including family, friends, and co-workers. Gambling addiction seriously affects absenteeism and job productivity. Gambling addicts are four times more likely to have mental depression and four times more likely to, commit, uh, to attempt suicide. If gambling, if legalized gambling, at, to the extent that we were talking about, were, were to happen today in Alabama, and we were, so we were to catch up with the national average and maybe even exceed it in terms of the amount of gambling in Alabama, then almost overnight we would create 25,000 more addicted gamblers in the state of Alabama. Social costs have been estimated by some to be three times, three dollars in social costs for every one dollar in revenues because you've got the cost of policing, you've got the, the addiction, you've got the depression, you've got the bankruptcies, you've got the family troubles. 
three dollars for every one dollar in revenue according to one source. Crime. I'd never heard this before I started preparing for, for tonight, but I think this is a pretty wise saying. Maybe some of you have heard it before. Bad things tend to happen where other bad things are happening. <laughs> think about it. The, so, there's an October 30th, 2012 article in the Washington Post. Again, no bastion of conservatism. October 30th, 2012, written by Dylan Matthews in the Washington Post, and he sets out the increases around casinos for property theft, auto theft, violent crime, substance abuse, uh, bankruptcies uh, where states have uh, embraced uh, gambling. Bad things tend to happen where other bad things are happening, where people are going and they don't have self-control, where they tend to be reckless. And the studies say that it increases the instances of sex trafficking, that casinos are great places to launder drug money, they're great places to launder sex trafficking money. And then there is this, maybe my second favorite. Let the people vote. I'm not, the senator might tell you, I, I don't gamble. I'm against it. But I, I think it's unfair not to let the people vote on it. So what would you say to that legislature, legislator if he said, you know, I've never used a prostitute. I don't plan to. But I think it's unfair not to let the people of Vestavia have a vote on whether they want to legalize prostitution. What would you say to that? What, what would that legislature? Uh, what would you say to that legislator if he said, "You know, I've, I've never used cocaine. I don't plan to use it, but I think we need to have a referendum in the state of Alabama whether to legalize cocaine and heroin. I think that'd be a good thing for us to do." Uh, we elect our leaders. This is a representative democracy. This is not a direct democracy, and we rep we elect leaders to be leaders to know more than we know, to have the information, not to defer and to deflect and to demur and avoid their responsibilities. When somebody tells you, the next legislator who tells you, let the people vote, as Les Bernal with the Predatory Gambling Organization nationally says, what they're really saying is, let the gambling interests buy the vote. Ask that legislator who says, I'm in favor of letting the people vote, how he would feel about a reasonably good opponent in his next bid for re-election, having, three, having three times more money to spend on advertising against him than he has. Maybe even five times more money to put out radio ads against him. No matter what his merits as a legislator are, if his opponent was a fairly decent fellow and could outspend him five to one, what would he think about his chances of winning, no matter how great a legislator he thinks he is? What if that imbalance was 100 to 1? Because the gambling interests are going to, if they need to, they'll spend $20 million on TV and radio ads in a heartbeat. That's chump change compared to the billions they're going to reap when this comes flooding into Alabama. And the churches and the pastors and the eagle forms of the world, uh, you know, th there'll be a struggle to raise a few hundred thousand dollars to oppose it in a referendum. Uh, so it's not a fair fight, and the legislators who say that know it's not a fair fight, which brings me to my last point. If gambling casinos are legalized in Alabama in the way that they're proposed, the gambling industry will absolutely control our politics. If you have neighbors who are agnostic on the issue of the morality of gambling, ask them, do you really want the gambling interests controlling Alabama politics for the next 50 years? You know, for the longest time, we've had two entities in Montgomery who've been very per per powerful entities. Alpha, I call them the two 800-pound gorillas. Eagle Forum and Uni Smith and some other organizations are secret weapons, but the, the, the overt battlefield in, in Montgomery, year after year, has been dominated especially candidate selection and funding, but also just legislative proposals has been dominated by two 800-pound gorillas, Alpha and the Business Council of Alabama. And we've gotten along pretty well. They don't always agree with each other, 
Maybe 80% of the time they, they agree. Maybe, maybe 85% of the time. But the end result is we've walked along and we hadn't been too bad with the legislation that's come out of Montgomery year after year. Now think about that old Japanese movie involving Godzilla where he comes into Tokyo and he's 80,000 pounds and 20 stories tall and is breathing fire and his tail is flying around and it's knocking buildings over and people are going flying. We're going to substitute two 800 pound gorillas for Godzilla in, in our politics. They're going to control uh, who runs for office, who wins office, they're going to control what happens in the legislature. They're going to control the votes on all these things that can be amended by regular legislation in the years to come. If it's going to make them money, then they're going to have the ability to control our policies in Alabama. That's not the Alabama that I grew up with. That's not the Alabama that you have fought for uh, for so many years and so many like you have fought for. Uh, that's not the Alabama we want for our children and our grandchildren. Um, as I was preparing these remarks, I about started about three or four days ago looking over some notes and stick. I, my, my desk is a mess, but sticking out from under the corner of some other papers was a paper, and I could see that much of it. <laughs> and I pulled it out. And it's a program from September of 2017, Uni, when you asked me to come up and say a prayer uh, in Washington at the National Conference. And, um, or say the Pledge of Allegiance, one or the other. And I uh, pulled it out, and there on the front page, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I saw that a few days ago, and I said, you know, that reminds me of another verse. What, what is that verse? It's in Chronicles. Is it 1 Chronicles or 2? I think it's 2 Chronicles. What is that verse? And I couldn't think. I've got to look that up. about Something about persevering and not giving up. And, and I couldn't think of it. That night, I went to pick up my granddaughter at Mountain Brook Gymnastics. In the practice gym at Mountain Brook Gymnastics, there are all these banners on the wall by corporate business sponsors. One banner that I caught my eye down at the bottom, some business sponsor had put at the bottom of it, no words, just the citation, 2 Chronicles 15.7. I said, that might be it. And I went back, here's what it says. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Thank you, Eagle Forum, for being strong all these years, for persevering, for seeking out what is good for your children and your grandchildren, for your neighbors, and for the community that we call Alabama, because it is a great place to live and to work and to raise a family. And, but we're at risk. We're at risk of losing it. So be strong. Don't give up. Pray that your efforts with Alabama senators will be rewarded. Thank you so much for who you are and what you do. Thank you.